I'll share screen. All right, Ericsson, then um, the stage is all yours if you would like to share your screen. Uh, yeah. So let me see. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, good. So, uh, good morning, everyone, if you are in my time zone in Waterloo. Uh, today, I will be giving a talk about entanglement harvesting in collapsing shell space time and a kind of new computational method it inspired during the it was inspired during this work it was a work uh, i did with my one of my supervisors rob man and it is published uh i guess two months ago in jhab so that's the archive number so uh the outline of the talk will be something like this uh, so the first two points i will motivate and introduce a little bit because i I believe that a lot of people in the Waterloo group at least have done a lot of harvesting in QFT, but apart from say Laura's group, uh, uh, black hole space-time uh, harvesting is not really investigated a lot. And first two points will review some basic notions in quantum field theory in curved space-times that you might have been familiar with, but if not, I hope it will be a good introduction. And then we'll go to part one and part two. I was asking Akim to give uh, to let me give a talk mainly because I wanted to introduce a mini trick in part two, but we'll see that uh, how it comes about. So first, uh, let us do a like mini crash course on QFT in black hole space types. So how do we usually probe quantum fields, whether you are in flat space or in curved space times? So uh, fundamentally, uh, we know that uh, there is no projective measurement in QFT, which is why you don't study QFT like quantum mechanics in the sense that you do projective measurements and stuff. But there are other ways to do this. For example, if you are in the weak coupling regime, solution one is do particle physics. Uh, so you use scattering processes, you use S matrix, and then you get a bunch of stuff you heard from standard model of particle physics. On the other hand, if you're in a strong coupling regime, like when you are doing QCD, you might have to use something else. But the solution that uh, and people like me are using are the second one, which is what we now call the relativistic quantum information. What we mean is that we use non-relativistic quantum system to probe the field as an intermediate step. So we use what we call the particle detectors. Now, this trick is very uh, useful because uh, by uh, in letting particle detectors interact, they are quantum mechanical objects. You can do anything you know from quantum mechanics and quantum information textbooks to study the field with the detectors as an intermediate step. And what is relativistic about it is that for example, the detector's motional degree of freedom, how it moves in space-time, is absolutely governed by special and general relativity. Now, the prototypical particle detector model in this formalism is what is now known after 40 years as the Unruh-DeWitt model. Uh, this is basically a simplified model of like matter interaction where you have, in the simplest case, a point like qubit, qubit is just a two-level system, interacting linearly with a quantum scalar field. Now, uh, the interaction Hamiltonian, if you look at my mouse, has the following ingredients. One is a switching function, which tells you how long the qubit interacts with the field, because any experiment interacts for finite times. You have a monopole moment, which is the, ingred the operator part of the qubit, and you have a scalar field evaluated along the detector's trajectory. Uh, this is really a model of a quantum mechanical dipole of an atom interacting with an electromagnetic field. So you might have seen in quantum mechanics textbooks before that uh, a dipole operator can interact with an electric field and the interacting Hamiltonian looks like this. This is what happens when you, for example, shine a laser on a hydrogen atom, uh, schematically anyway. Now, why are these particle detectors very useful? The main reason is because they are very versatile. For example, if you have any curved space-time, 
you can easily change this model to account for it. You can also modify this model to a lot of greater complexity. For example, here you see that scalar field can be easily promoted to quantum fields, monopole promoted to dipole. You can easily make this into a spinner field. You can include quadruple moment. You can even quantize the center of mass so that the positions of the detector is delocalized. You can include finite size and many other things. But one of the most important things for entanglement harvesting is that this kind of particle detector model easily accounts for many, many detectors in, in space-time. That means you can just add how many detectors you want. Next, what about the black hole space-time itself? Now, what we know is that after 45 years, this is still active. We are basically studying the semi-classical regime where gravity is purely classical, but your source can be quant quantum stress energy tensor. Now, people have been studying this ever since uh, 1970s using a lot of tools from Bogolibov transformations to our particle detector models. Some use holography and a lot of other things. One of the most important results in this area is the gravitational field can generate particle excitations. Uh, famously, uh, you, uh, the one we know is called the Hawking effect, where the black holes are really not black, but evaporate by emitting thermal radiation with a lot of caveats in, uh, behind, okay? Now, in the language of the detector that we mentioned in the previous slide, what this means is that if you have a detector and put it outside a black hole, it might click it might get excited with a rate that is governed approximately by a thermal Planckian spectrum. Then you know that the radiation is sort of thermal. Uh, also a few caveats there. But formally, in the technical sense, the most important thing is that quantum field in curved space-time taught us that a quantum field in general has a non-unique, unitarily inequivalent vacuum states. So unlike textbooks in particle physics, we usually only write vacuum states as cat zero, which we think is the unique one. But really, if you look for this effect called Unruh effect, uh, discovered by uh, Unruh, Davies, and Fulling, uh, you will see that the vacuum state defined by an accelerating observer is actually the vacuum state defined by an inertial observer actually is observed by an accelerating observer as a thermal state which means that if you are if two observers are not inertially related by a lorentz trans, simple lorentz transformation in general the vacuum are not equivalent so what what is an empty vacuum state in one frame is uh, in in for one observer might be a might be a frame where there are a lot of particles there. Now, if we take one step back, how do people study quantum fields? Usually you solve the Klein-Gordon equation, which is the wave equation in flat space. You write the Fourier mode decomposition, which looks like the center equation here, and then uh, you are done, right? Because if you if you are in particle physics, this U of K, the eigenmodes of the Klein-Gordon equation would be just plane waves. But in curved space-time, this can be a very, very complicated object. Now, the crucial thing is that in the definition of the vacuum state, what we really know is that any U K here must be able, uh, must solve this eigenvalue equation. What this, this this eigenvalue equation, which is the Lie derivative with respect to the killing vector, really tells us what is positive frequency. As a simple example, if you are in flat space, UK is just a plane wave. So the Lie derivative with respect to the usual time derivative would just give you the partial derivative of the plane wave, which is just giving you eigenvalue, the frequency. Now in curved space time, actually, this is just the extension. Now, let us specialize to a particular case where we have a black hole space-time. So, for example, an eternal static spherically symmetric black hole has a metric given by the following uh, Schwarzschild uh, metric. Now, the Kruskal diagram is a convenient way to write how the whole space-time looks like. But what's important is that if you, if you pick standard textbooks or look for papers, unfortunately, 
uh, is quite difficult to dig this out. There are three standard inequivalent vacuum states for black hole QFT. One is the Boulware vacuum. This is what you would call vacuum well defined in the exterior of the black hole. It has the property that if you are far away, this is what you would have seen as a truly empty vacuum state. But this, uh, the hartle hawking vacuum is defined for the whole space time. And this would be what people think of as a thermal state. That means the black hole is inside a thermal bath of some temperature. And UNRU vacuum is really a, pos uh, a vacuum defined within region one and two. That means the black hole interior and exterior, but excludes the, the alternate universe part. Now, those are very, very uh, mouthful, but really, why do we care? First thing, Boulware vacuum is what you would expect for something that uh, an asymptotically flat observer should see in the sense that it is the true vacuum if you are far away. But the problem is that Boulware vacuum, you don't really hear it much because the stress energy tensor actually diverges uh, at the future and past horizons of the black hole. Uh, we know that uh, stress energy tensor shouldn't diverge uh, near the horizon because otherwise quantum field theory in curved space-time is not valid. But we'll see how we address this state. Now, hartle hawking vacuum is actually what usually people know as a thermal state with Hawking temperature T. This is, this is what people heard from Hawking radiation. Now, this is very tricky because actually if you, if you do path integral formulation for quantum field in black hole spacetime, the one that you get is usually this state. Now, the one that is most interesting to us is the UNRU vacuum, which is what people think of as black holes radiating. What happens is that, uh, UNRU vacuum is very useful because uh, it models Hawking effect in the sense that at late times, after the black hole has long form, uh, this gives you a simple approximation of how a, a, an evap thermal radiation coming from evaporation actually means. And it has the correct out flux with the corresponding temperature equal to the hartle hawking one. Now, the difference between hartle hawking and UNRU is that hartle hawking vacuum corresponds to a thermal buff in equilibrium. That means it's like you put a black hole in a, in a pot with the same temperature. But UNRU vacuum is just a thermal flux. That means it's a non-equilibrium space-time with just radiating outwards to infinity. And finally, we are almost done with the crash course, is that there is a model of collapsing space-time formed by a black hole formed by a collapsing matter. And this is given 50 years ago by uh, Vaidya. So Vaidya uh, gives a metric for something that forms a spherically symmetric black hole. Now, we can also define a vacuum state for QFT on this space-time and we call it the Vaidya vacuum. Okay, what is good about this vacuum is that as, as what you expect from a collapse, bef when you, before it forms a black hole, Far away, it looks just like a Minkowski spacetime. But once it forms a black hole, outside the black hole is just exactly what you expect from the Svarsfield spacetime. So this is really a simple model where you divide the spacetime into two parts, the flat one and the uh, black hole part. And as a simple model that we are going to use, we'll use a thin null shell collapse. That means the shell is really like a delta function, which is very, very thin. And once it collapses, it just gives you exactly the Svarsfield metric. So far, so good. Uh, feel free to just ask any questions in the case that uh, you have any doubts. So next, uh, why do we care about uh, this particular space time? So the reason is because one of the standard folklore is that the state of a test quantum field in a collapsing star spacetime that forms a black hole at late times is, can be well approximated by the state of a quantum field in an eternal black hole. That means as the black hole is always there, but when you describe it using the UNRU vacuum. And obviously we know that this correspondence is not exact because for one, UNRU state is really only a good approximation at late time because you ignore how the black hole was formed, which is why you can use eternal black hole as your model, right? You don't care about what, how it started. Now, Juarez Aubrey and 
Yorma Luko uh, uh, asked the question of how good this approximation really is for various things. So for example, they compute the renormalized st stress energy tensor, how, how often a detector clicks near the event horizon and also at future null infinity. And they use one plus one dimensional conformal techniques because it can give them exact closed form expressions. And one trick that uh, you might have may or may not have heard before is that in this computation, they mimic three plus one dimensional calculation uh, with derivative coupling. What this means is that in one plus one, we know that quantum fields has a two point function that grows logarithmically. On the other hand, the Hadamard short distance property says that in three plus one dimensions, uh, short distance behavior of a correlation function should scale like a square of a power uh, space time separation. So if you take a derivative of the right hand side, the log squared will give you one over something and it, it, it will give you the correct scaling behavior. We'll see this again later. They are, but their main result is that Unruh vacuum for all practical purposes is a good approximation. However, there's a catch there. If you look at their paper, right, uh, their calculation for detectors uh, transition rate actually mixes late time, li com uh, late time limit and a long interaction regime. That means when they say that the detectors uh, transition rate after at late times is really the same thing as turning on at some finite time and then let it turn on forever. So that means what they mean by late time necessarily means it's uh, interacting for a long time. And for early times, it also necessarily means it in interacts only for finite times. And this is a bit problematic because you are mixing two very different effects. For example, schematically, they have this formula and there is a delta tau here that tells you how long that thing uh, interacts and their late time is equivalent to taking delta tau goes to infinity. But this is the same thing as taking long interaction times. And the early times means delta tau is finite. And you see that that means whatever conclusion they get about the Planckian spectrum that you see here is really a long time limit. Our goal is really to understand how these four vacuum states generate correlations. And we will also address the finite time versus long time issues uh, in the previous slide. This is really the overarching goal of this, uh, this work. And our, the tool that we use because it's convenient and it's like killing ant stones, uh, killing ant birds with one stone, is that we'll use entanglement harvesting protocol. Uh, for for people who are not familiar with this protocol, what it means is that if I take two particle detectors that started off not correlated at all, they can extract entanglement from the quantum field vacuum even though they are space-like separated. That means they are not causally connected. And this protocol has been studied many, many times by many different people in different contexts. And it is sensitive to various uh, global properties of the space-time. But uh, in our case, the most relevant part is the fact that a lot of these studies focus on static space-times with the exception that for harvesting, only recent work using gravitational wave actually includes uh, time-dependent uh, situations. But even then it's approximately flat. So we will be uh, giving a first analysis of a truly non-stationary space-time when, when we study Vaidya. Okay, so let's start. What do we need to do to uh, work with entanglement harvesting? Actually, there's a recipe for this. So first, prepare two qubits, put them in ground states, uh, fix radius away from the black hole, as you can see from this, and let them interact with the interaction Hamiltonian given by uh, the following, which is the Unruh DeWitt Hamiltonian with slight modification. Chi here is the switching time of each detector. This is the monopole moment of each detector. But here, you let the detector interact with the field, but with this U mu covariant derivative of mu. This is basically the partial tau, which is the proper time derivative of the field. This thing was there, if you recall, to make sure that the logarithmic short distance behavior uh, was turned into a one over distance squared uh, relationship so that you mimic aspects of a three plus one kind of calculation. Schematically, 
if you are doing quantum information, it looks roughly something like this. You have a three input made of two quant uh, ground states of the detector and a field vacuum. You have a unitary that prescribes the interaction, which is the exponent time order exponential of the interaction Hamiltonian. And then you trace out the field's degree of freedom so that what are, you are left is the final state of the two detectors. And then what we are interested in is, for example, compute the bipartite entanglement between the two qubits after interactions. The ingredient goes as follow, the recipe goes as follows. The monopole is just given by this expression. It's basically a raising and lowering operator of the qubit in the interaction picture. Omega is the energy gap of the detector. The initial state are the product uncorrelated ground states for each sector, where alpha is or any of the four distinct vacuum of the black hole. The time evolution for this Hamiltonian is given by a unitary uh, with time ordered exponential. It's time ordered because the Hamiltonian has a, has a time dependence in it. And we know from standard QFT that you can do a Dyson series expansion if we are in the weak coupling regime where you can do perturbation theory. And if you do perturbation theory, the final reduced density matrix is basically given by the usual time evolution, which is the unitary evolution of the state. But you trace out the field degree of freedom so that the density matrix describing the two qubits will have this form. And you, re you see that there, there are a bunch of terms that tells you that this thing will be, the two qubits will be correlated. Now, the, in particular, the LAA, LAB, and LBB is basically the local terms. That means it depends on where the detectors are. So, so if LAB means it depends on the location of detector A and detector B, LAA means it only depends on detector A, and M is the non-local contribution that is very important for the entanglement calculation. So I'm showing you this uh, just to show what goes into the calculation in order to compute the final density matrix. But the important object of this calculation is this script A here, which is the derivative coupling Weichmann function. This is written like this. It is just the two-point correlation functions of the field, but in derivative coupling. So this is the field part of the, the how field how how the quantum field enters the calculation of the density matrix. Now, up to this point, if you have done harvesting work or heard harvesting work before, uh, this is basically the same as uh, everyone else. Now the hard part is that this computation actually needs careful numerical treatment because for one, this thing looks very nasty. You will see this in the second half. And what we propose is that in part two, we'll do what we call a numerical contour integration. Uh, in, uh, this may or may not be a new thing depending on how you use Mathematica, but I think for many, it will be new. Now, the crucial thing in our calculation is that unlike uh, in the previous work on Vidya black hole, we don't need to really restrict to just near infinity and near horizon, and then you do some serious expansion to simplify your calculation. With this, we will be able to probe every part of the space line. Eric, so excuse me, I'm a little confused with the proper times there. Yeah. So you have two detectors, right? And they undergo different trajectories. Yes. Uh, are you assuming that both of the trajectories can be parameterized by the same like proper time parameter? Because, uh, no, I don't know. Don't. It, don't. Okay, so, so you actually have two different definitions of this. This partial tau, phi x of tau, it's actually partial tau a over detector a and, and partial yeah, tau yeah. b over detector b. So, okay. so the tau a and tau b, uh, are a priori without anything cannot be relabeled as just tau. But at, at the second line here, right, I'm just treating this as just a, as a functional variable, right? All right, in the sense that these, these partial taus are actually u mu number mu, right? So you can, they're a function of the, the x of, of tau. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay. so in this second line here, I, I'm just writing, I'm just treating it as a function. Like here, you really need tau a and tau b. And the way how they affect each other is basically, basically redshift factors are going to fly around somewhere in here, which is to account for the fact that they are not the same proper times. All right, okay, thank you. Finally, for entanglement harvesting, of course, you need a measures of entanglement. For qubits, you can use concurrence. 
concurrence is a faithful entanglement monotone for two qubits, and it is given by this simple expression. It's the two maximum between zero and the non-local term minus the square root of the local term, which is why we were interested in those, those integrals. You can actually also extend this to compute, for example, the mutual information, which, which includes classical co uh, correlations. And we did this in our paper as well. And it will be made of a bunch of stuff that is not difficult to compute once you know how to compute the integral. So to wrap up part one, we will show some basic results. Okay, so the first one is that uh, if you look at the concurrence, which is the measure of entanglement, one thing you notice is that certainly, like many harvesting results, uh, a lot of things will not will be correlated after interacting with the field. But one, we we see that near the horizon, you you cannot harvest any entanglement. Of course, how big this region is depends of a lot of parameters. But essentially, what happens is that as you bring detectors closer to horizon, right? the detector's local noise overpowers the non-local correlations. The reason is because as you go closer to the horizon, each detector has to fight harder against gravity to remain at fixed radius. At r equals to 2m, the detectors, uh, the even horizon of the black hole, no detector can remain static. Uh, and that's really what, what they have to fight with. But what might be a little bit surprising is that all the four different vacuum states in general have different entangling power for each detector. This might come as a surprise if you look at it formally because from the perspective of uh, axiomatic quantum field theory, the vacuum states of all the quantum fields are actually UV divergent. That means they are just infinite if you compute it naively. But when you use detectors to try to see how they work, to correlate detectors, they correlate by different amount, even though formally speaking, they are all vacuum states of the quantum field. So uh, this has happened, uh, uh, as far as I know, uh, we know that different choice of vacuum do have different properties, but uh, for a single space time, I believe this is the first time I have seen where, where different uh, different vacua of the same space-time actually uh, correlates uh, very differently. But depending on how you look at it, it may or may not be surprising. But what's important here is that even for finite interaction times, that means the detector only interacts for finite times, right? UNRU vacuum really is approximated very well by a Vaidya vacuum because you can see that the plots basically hug each other when you are very close to the horizon. But on the other hand, once you get far away, basically the one that approximates well the uh, Vaidya vacuum, the collapsing space-time, is actually the Boulware vacuum. Remember that Boulware vacuum was usually something, it's a concept you usually throw away because it's unphysical near the horizon, but it turns out that for physically realistic situations where you have a collapse of matter, really Boulware vacuum is a relevant vacuum so long as you are not near the horizon. And Vaidya vacuum is basically a simple model where you interpolate between these two vacuum states. Now, Another way to look at this is that if you look at the space-time, right, they are really, what happens is that UNRU vacuum approximates Vaidya vacuum really well so long as you are near the horizon. But really this is also, this near the horizon limit actually goes all the way to asymptotic future, I plus, which means that if you are late time, Vaidya also is well approximated by UNRU vacuum. So that means so long as you are here, even if you are far away, even if you are, if you look at my mouse here, if I am very near scry plus the null infinity, but I'm very late, I'm UNRU vacuum also works well. On the other hand, if I am very far away, but I'm at early times, then the one that works well is Boulware. And if you map this region one for the eternal black hole here to the region one of the collapsing space time here, you get exactly the same situation. What happens is that early times, if you are here, then the Boulware vacuum describes very well this region. Here, UNRU vacuum works very well. Now, our calculation uh, shows that anything in between is somewhere the results is in between. Okay, so that's, 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 that's 
that's the one that's the one thing you can do it numerically and this is quite remarkable because this really justifies a lot of approximations that uh, people use and this uh, and doing this numerically in the one plus one model actually makes this really clear because actually three plus one Schwarzschild calculation is notoriously difficult. Now the third result which is a little bit funny quantum information kind of thing is that there is a weird non uh, signaling bit in curved space time. So what happens is that I have a signaling estimator here, which is basically an integral over the field commutator with respect to the vacuum. And what happens is that if this thing is non-zero, then we say that the two detectors can actually talk to each other uh, via the field. What this means <clears throat> Ericsson, we've had problem. Uh, I have had problems hearing you in the last twenty seconds or so. Can you please repeat? Yeah, same here. I think it's a connection issue. Oh. Ericsson, I think you're back. Now, now we can see your camera. Uh, when when was I disconnected? About um, twenty, well, ten seconds ago. But we lost the sound about twenty-five seconds ago. Okay, so so is it okay that I start from this this slide? We don't see the slide. You're not sharing anymore. Oh yes, wait. So can you see the slides now? Yep. Yeah, so is, uh, if it is okay, maybe I should just start from this slide if it is 25 seconds ago, I guess. Okay. Okay. Uh, oh, was it from here? Give maybe a just a little earlier. This one? Okay, yes. Okay. No, not the entire slide again. Um, I think it happened somewhere in the middle here. Yeah, so the moral of the story uh, I wanted to mention in this slide, just to recap, is that really if you are along the horizon and all the way to the asymptotic future, if you are very late times and you're also near the horizon, then unroof vacuum for all practical purposes reproduces what you want. If you are very early times and or you are very, very far away, which in the case of Vaidya state, that means you are somewhere here, then the Vaidya vacuum is actually well approximated by the Boulevard state instead. And any region in between can be well interpolated between these two states. So this gives a very nice description of how the, the collapsing space-time model actually smoothly transitions from the Boulevard vacuum to the Unruh vacuum, which justifies a lot of approximations we see in the literature. And this is nice because we can do this calculation kind of semi-analytically. While in, in the true three plus one calculation, this is extremely hard to do because of the spherical harmonics. Now, the funny result that I'm going to uh, next is about signaling. So let me compute what I call the signaling estimator, which is an integral over the interaction time of the detectors with the field commutator. Now, why is this important? It's because we want to know whether the correlations that the detectors generate come from the two detectors talking to each other. Okay, now if the detectors talk to each other, then what happens is that uh, the correlations might not be so surprising after all. But what you see here is that if the detectors are, for the first figure, the detectors are very close, uh, very, very closely uh, separated. And you see that uh, as expected, far away, the correlations are kind of approaches a constant because that's what you expect in flat space. And the signaling is also in general non-zero. But once you are, once you bring the detectors far away from each other, then what happens is that you see this funny behavior because as you bring them far away from the black hole, they cannot harvest, uh, they cannot harvest entanglement because they are too far apart, but also the signaling is zero because they are space-like separated. But on the other hand, there is this weird intermediate regime 
where even though far away, they, the estimator says there are space like separated, in the intermediate regime, there is a small part of the space time where they are actually suddenly still time like. How you know it's time like is because according to the field computator, this better be zero if they were space like. So somehow curvature is not letting it is is not keeping the space like behavior constant at all places. And this might be correlated with the fact that there is an amplification of entanglement in some intermediate region. And here we see that they are kind of overlapping uh, in a very precise sense. So this is something that uh, might be interesting for for future work where the relationship between communication and entanglement harvesting uh, is better studied. But this is one way where curvature is actually interfering with signaling. And that's the end of the harvesting result, at least. Uh, is there any question? Uh, if not, then I will move on to the next part, which is the numerical contour integration. So, if we look back at the previous part, right? Really, what it boils down is that you want to compute this local and non-local contribution, which is a bunch of double integrals that looks like this. Now, for our calculation, we use chi to be a Gaussian because Gaussian is a very well-behaved, nice uh, function to describe switching. In particular, it lets you describe how you turn on detectors smoothly. Now, the problem is that as any two-point correlation function, this is actually a distribution. That means as an object, it behaves like a Dirac delta function. It's not a true function, but it only works for test integrals over the test functions. What it means is that formally, you will see I epsilon prescription flying everywhere when people define correlation functions. Now in this space-time, despite, despite the fact that you can write the Weichmann function analytically, uh, you cannot actually simplify this integral analytically. In flat space, you can. And why, how to appreciate this fact is that if you try to compute it, formally, the definition of each Weichmann function for different vacuum looks like this, where all the U's and V's are defined in terms of the space-time coordinates. So in general relativity, you will see this as a null coordinates, which is Eddington, Finkelstein, and Kruskal coordinates. And there is a tortoise coordinates defined in this manner. And for Vidya space-time, you even have another definition called U-bar, which includes a very special function called Lambert W function, which arises because when you have a collapsing shell, you need to match the quantum field at the shell so that it is smoothly connected between the outside the shell and inside the shell. Now, the point of this slide is just to show you that what actually is required for you to compute this kind of stuff. And if you have used Mathematica before, the Vidya Weichmann function looks like this mess. Okay, so actually these are all a single Weichmann function. So you need to add up all these four together to integrate one, one matrix elements. Now our goal is really to try to integrate using Mathematica without really having to code your own thing and be a numerical analysis person. Now as a test bit, you can use, you can just test it on how to compute transition probability in flat space. In flat space, uh, transition probability is a very simple thing the, because the Weichmann function is just a one over T minus T prime minus I epsilon squared. And it's a lot simpler than the curved space time one. And why we are using a test bit like this is because there is a closed form expression we can actually find for this one. So let us for now call J alpha to be the same integral, but for different methods. So to appreciate what happens with this calculation, let us first show that there is an analytic expression for this. It's given in terms of the complementary error functions and the Gaussian. And if you let, take it, let it take specific value, omega sigma equals one, this gives J zero equals to this particular value. Uh, I will show you again this value often later. Now, 
the first method is to just directly do numerical integration of the uh, of the transition probability and you can try this in Mathematica if you have one and you will find that I epsilon prescription brute force will not actually work. I plot here the table of how it varies with epsilon and you realize that the values don't even come close no matter how you play around with it. I have played around with a lot of settings and none of it works out. So maybe if you have a clever settings that, that might work in Mathematica, uh, I would love to hear from it. But I, I tried for about one month and I didn't manage to get anywhere. Obviously, if this thing fails in flat space, uh, there's no hope for curved space times. Now, what we propose a few months back is that perform instead the following integration. Basically, you do numerical control integration in the sense that instead of using I epsilon, you let the pole be taken care of using contour integrals. And theoretically, you understand this very well because I epsilon is precisely telling you how to do contour integration. But what, what may be a little bit uh, unusual is that Mathematica doesn't have a documentation on how to do contour integration. It just tells you that it can integrate functions with complex values. So what you need to do is to actually explicitly tell Mathematica to do the contour yourself. That means you, you tell them which contour to pick. The first observation you should notice is that unlike textbook complex analysis, where we are taught how to do contour integrals in one dimension, here you need to actually do contour integrals in two dimensions. So in this particular example, you have a continuum of poles for every t. And it turns out that if you just do this, even though technically they are the same thing, the approximation works really well. You can see that the first digit is basically the same thing. The, the real part is basically the same as the exact expression. And it gives you a natural cross-checking because you know in complex analysis that if you deform the contour by a little bit or, or as big as you want, so long as it doesn't cross any other poles, the answer should be constant. And this is what happens here. When you change the epsilon, you are really changing the size of the contour. And the answer doesn't change as you expect. The imaginary part is basically the numerical error. Naively, if you try this on the curved space-time example for, this, uh, for, for the presentation I gave today, it actually didn't quite work. The reason is twofold. One thing is that numerically it's just unstable, but there's another reason is that for very complicated space-time, the poles are not just going to be t minus t prime. Okay? The pole can be a very complicated function of t, and inverting this can be a pain if you don't have enough symmetry. So what happens is that because we are using Gaussian switching, the integral contains Gaussians, you can cut off the integral at very far away on the positive and the negative real axis. And it boils down to the fact that you are picking a rectangular contour like this and cut off the tails. Now, this has the benefit that you don't even need to figure out where the poles of the very complicated Weichmann function anymore because you, either out, you are either outside the integration domain or if you are inside, it is taken care of here. It has to be somewhere in between here. And we have te tested this for our paper. We have tested it for other cases. For example, uh, someone in Rob's group studied rotating BTZ black holes and I have checked that this thing also works. Now, there are some things you can think about this numerical integration. For example, when you try to compute the non-local term, right? In some, in some cases, you might want to use the heavy side version. You might want to write the non-local term in terms of heavy side type function. And you might have seen this before in har some harvesting papers. But the problem is that Mathematica's heavy side type function doesn't let you take the argument to be a complex number, which means that if you plug this thing into the numerical calculation, it cannot counter integrate because we explicitly tell Mathematica to go into the complex plane. So the solution that I found out recently, around two weeks ago, is that basically just avoid this issue by approximating the heavy side. But there's a trade-off in a sense that any analytic approximation of the heavy side usually has infinitely many poles. So you have to make sure that your counter integrals don't gain Ex don't cross extra poles and give you extra residues. And this is something that I've been trying to work on uh, passively and I'm trying to write a short write-up for Mathematica Journal just in case it might be useful for other people who are doing something else. And this work is generally 
in this direction. So you can, for example, currently I'm looking into extending the same methods to free falling detectors where we really want to see how detectors generate correlations when they are free falling, especially because free falling detectors can go through the horizon. And also I've, uh, I'm working with a fourth year undergrad on modified entanglement, entanglement harvesting. Now, for modified gravity, you might suspect that uh, depending on the situation, modified gravity uh, has the funny feature that it might not be valid for dimensions greater, uh, dimension four or lower. But what happens is that depending on which, which uh, modified gravity you study, there might be a chance that you you can do the truncation and reduce it to one plus one calculation. So this is something that I'm, I'm starting to look at, into. And essentially, uh, that's the end of the talk. I'm not sure if I'm on the right time, but I think I am. <laughs>